Hi, I'm Jeff Pollack, Vice President of Products at Oracle. I'm here with you now as part of this Data Mesh series. You can find previous videos in the series by going to the YouTube playlist here. In previous videos of this series, we've had more in-depth discussions about the three essential characteristics of a data mesh that include data product orientation, decentralized data processing, and event-driven stream-centric workloads. We've also covered details about how data replication and messaging tools like Apache Kafka can be combined to achieve a distributed real-time event mesh that you can trust with mission-critical data. We then extrapolate this concept and extend to microservices design patterns in a look at how messaging and replication can simplify event sourcing, CQRS, and transaction outbox patterns for the whole enterprise. We've illustrated how the concept of a data mesh can scale from edge from gateways and into various public and private cloud infrastructure. And in part three, we also previewed a demo that highlights how a data mesh can provide real-time events across applications, databases, on-premise systems, Amazon Cloud, and Oracle Cloud using a simple self-service tool and a distributed microservices architecture. Finally, to keep things very real, we've always tried to stay focused on the value and the outcomes that the data mesh brings to business and IT. But for today, we're focusing on part five of the series, which will focus first on the importance of a data mesh for operational data, second on why data pipelines are essential, and third, how it's the control plane that makes a mesh a mesh. To wrap up, we'll answer the question of whether everyone needs a mesh at all. Okay, so to begin with, the remainder of this presentation today, we'll be talking a lot about comparisons and contrasts around what a data mesh is, what it isn't, and different concepts that have been put out there by uh, other folks that talk about the data mesh. Uh, but to really begin this presentation, I really wanted to point out the, uh, the work that the ThoughtWorks team has put in here, going all the way back to 2019. They've really um, in many ways coined the term and allowed this term, the data mesh, to really take off. And they've done some phenomenal work um, in these areas in particular here that we're looking at. Number one, around framing the problem, uh, uh, the, the problem uh, historically around uh, data-oriented architectures being that they were largely composed of monolithic frameworks, and now we need to really shift towards this distributed uh, microservices type architecture that allows us to uh, disseminate uh, workloads more broadly across an infrastructure and ecosystem, kind of shifting away from that monolithic approach of the past. I think the ThoughtWorks team has really um, driven that point home and done a lot of great work in kind of framing the, the challenges of the old ways. Um, the second big area here, I think, is uh, the ThoughtWorks team has, has really done a great job at articulating the mindset shift that needs to happen around um, moving towards an architecture where data is a product rather than just a byproduct of applications and IT organizations. And so when we begin to conceptualize data as the output, as the item that has value, as a product that needs to be managed as a product, we really begin to adopt this mindset shift that needs to happen in order to embrace a data mesh as really a next generation way of, of managing data. And then finally, I think the ThoughtWorks team has done a, a phenomenal job with kind of doubling down on this notion of a decentralized distributed architecture that needs to underpin the infrastructure and deployment architecture of a next generation uh, data mesh. As we pivot away from those monolithic architectures of the past towards the future, all of our customers, every single large IT organization in the world will eventually have loads of different infrastructure that they need to, to manage. And today that could be multiple public cloud vendors, uh, private cloud infrastructure, on-premise infrastructure. Um, the reality of our future is that uh, any organization of substantial size will have a lot of different locations where workloads run and the data integration architecture can't stay stuck in a monolithic type of approach. And so as we do data management, as we do data integration, as we do analytics and in fact operational workloads, uh, we need to have an infrastructure that is built from the ground up to be able to handle those decentralized and distributed architectures. Um, there are a couple of areas where I think uh, our approach towards data mesh may diverge from some others in the industry. So I'm not 100% sure 
Um, but the remainder of this talk will actually drill down into three key areas uh, for us where we think uh, we need some clarification or perhaps there might be some disagreements on uh, points of emphasis for the data mesh. So the first topic, I think we mostly agree on, but I'm not 100% sure based off of what I've read and what I've watched, is the need to drive this intersection between operational data on the one hand and analytics data on the other hand. So historically speaking, operational data has always been the source of truth. It's the origin of data composed of our ERP applications, our SaaS applications, our custom applications running on relational databases and transactional systems. This tends to be where data originates in the context of an enterprise. And what we want to be able to do is to take these data domains that exist in the operational side of the IT organization and make sure that they're aligned with the data domains that we conceptualize and govern and manage for the analytics side, the data warehouses, the, the data lakes, the data services. And in order to bring these two together, we really need to find a solution that is suitable for the intersection of operational data and analytics data so that we don't have this artificial split between the two sides of the IT organization and how they manage their data. Uh, topic number two is actually around uh, the elevation of data pipelines as a first class entity or as a first class item within a, in a, uh, within a data mesh. And this is an area I know we have a difference of opinion on in, uh, in our conceptualization of the data mesh, data pipelines are absolutely a necessity. They're a mandatory first class element of a data mesh. And we'll go into a lot of depth in today's talk around why that's the case and why you can't really materialize or instantiate a data mesh without governing and managing and creating pipelines at scale and, and why that really necessitates a first class conceptualization of the uh, data pipelines themselves. And then finally, for topic number three, uh, we're gonna spend some time discussing control planes and why control planes are really a necessary part of a data mesh and why if you don't have some type of common control plane in a data mesh, you know, I'm not even sure you have a data mesh at all without a control plane. Um, it really would, I think, in some ways just evolve towards the disorganized, monolithic uh, types of data management architectures that we've seen in the past. One of the things when we conceptualize distributed and decentralized from the ground up is we need to have some patterns to manage and orchestrate data domains and pipelines that are distributed across a variety of different infrastructure. So these will be the three topics that we're drilling in today. I uh, hope you enjoy the discussion. And with that, let's go ahead and get into our first topic. From the very beginning, the concept of the data mesh was contrasted directly with monolithic data lake and analytics architectures. And in fact, for most of the past 10 years, the data integration part of enterprise data management has mostly been focused on the online analytic processing or OLAP use cases. Just in the past decade, we've seen the rise and fall of many data management tools dedicated to improving how enterprises do analytics simpler, at scale, and inexpensively in the cloud. So now, as we contemplate the emergence of data mesh, it begs the question, are we only focused on data domains and data products in the analytics domain? What about operational data, applications, and the systems that otherwise run the business and the economy as a whole? I've seen some hints that the other data mesh pundits may agree, but I can't emphasize enough for myself how important it is to unify the separation of OLTP and OLAP data domains. It's really a critical element in the success of a modern next generation data mesh. OLTP systems are the applications and transactional systems that run the business and the economy as a whole. These are the mission critical systems that can never go down, and they're the source of truth for much of the world's most valuable data assets. These are the systems that require the strongest data consistency controls, require the most trust, and demand the greatest resiliency around planned and unplanned downtime. On the other hand, analytic systems are not typically defined as mission critical in that if they're offline for some periods of time, there is usually no direct financial impact on the business. Likewise, the nature of analytics and data science are such that sometimes it's okay to have eventually consistent data, or even some missing records. For example, in the case of developing statistical machine learning models, there are also highly governed reporting systems that demand perfectly consistent data for regulatory and compliance purposes, 
but these typically operate as conventional data warehouses. Historically, these two different data ecosystems have been, have been divided. Usually it's been up to the ETL technologies and the monolithic IT processes to join them up. And you know what they say about a house divided. Okay, so perhaps enterprise IT is not at risk of totally falling down. We are where we are, right? But for large enterprises, the sprawl of data management across operational and analytic systems has become more and more complex as the years have gone by. Even medium-sized businesses may have many different ERP systems, a legacy of applications from previous M&A activity across multiple business units, lines of business may not be integrated at all or only with rudimentary file-based or batch-based uh, data processes that were common you know, from 40 or 50 years ago, and the geographic boundaries of any multinational may require data partitions and cross-cutting business processes that span multiple operational divisions. And so what we wind up with is that form follows function, and we have all of these organizational and process boundaries that separate business operations from each other and operations from the analytics teams. It's the operational applications that run the business. They make the money and they track all the capital assets. Over the past 10 to 15 years, the analytics systems have definitely been more in fashion for IT. There's really been an explosion of new technologies, open source initiatives, and also the rise of the public cloud alternative has made computing analytics, machine learning, and data lakes much more affordable at vast scale. But the result of operational churn on the operations side combined with the technology churn across the board is that we're left with these artificial processes and data ownership boundaries that just aren't helpful for the business. Consider the vast number of operational systems that run the business, make the money, and track the money. These are the backbone of our employers and of the global economy as a whole. They are the ERP systems that run the business, they're the marketing applications that drive much of the larger companies in the world. They could even be the smaller applications that your small local businesses use to run their operations. Even in the world of utilities, they could be meter data management systems that bring the electricity and the gas uh, to your homes. So these are ultimately the source of truth and the creators of the mission critical data that we ultimately need to bring over into the analytics side of the house, uh, but that are really the foundation of these operational systems that are running the business from day to day. These operational data domains require data management solutions that are actually a great fit for data mesh capabilities. Operational data needs to be highly available across cloud storage containers, needs to be resilient in case of failures, and we need to make operational data domains available across many different cloud infrastructures. Mission critical data must survive no downtime upgrades, and we need to regularly synchronize reference data across geographically sharded environments that may be separated for the purposes of regulatory and compliance needs. As new application design patterns take off, we need to bring trusted, strongly consistent data to the world of microservices, application event sourcing, and transaction outbox event data for data replication and change data capture. So the importance of operational data cannot be overstated. If the operations fail, companies usually have immediate and deep financial impacts. They can lose revenue for each minute a system is down, they lose their customers, trust, they may lose a customer for life. For some highly valued brands, high profile systems failure can cause irreparable harm to the brand. And ultimately it affects shareholder value for publicly traded companies that are in the stock market. This may all sound really dramatic, but it's true. These operational systems are the foundation of how a lot of businesses run and they really affect how businesses are perceived by the consumers that use those businesses. So it's about as important as it gets. Since operational data is so crucial for the business, why did we split it out to begin with? So, you know, going back 40 or 50 years ago, there were actually some pretty good technical reasons to split out uh, operational data from analytics data. We have operational systems that are very much write intensive. It's about the inserts and the updates of the data, and we had to optimize data structures for those purposes. In contrast, on the analytics side, 
These are systems that are typically very read intensive. So it's about um, reading the data, issuing queries, and making joins across the data. And we've optimized from a technical standpoint all the way from the modeling layers at the high level down into how we store the data on physical disks in order to optimize for those two different use cases. And then ultimately, as we've discussed before, form follows function. And these original differences in physical architecture have kind of manifested themselves now in organizational practices, the way that our human factors are organized within companies. From business units, we may have different teams that run different application um, environments uh, for different purposes. And then from an analytics side, even within a single organization, we may have a different team that runs analytics and data science, then runs the operational applications. So ultimately, these human factors are some of the most important, but also the most difficult areas to change. And you know the legacy environments that uh, these applications um, are, where these applications are still running, uh, are really nearly impossible to to rip and replace. However, we do not need to accept these artificial divisions across data domains, and we don't need to accept the legacy batch processing models that have separated the uh, analytics domains from the operational domains. As Malcolm Gladwell might say, we've reached a tipping point where there's a kind of a confluence of events that now allow us to move forward in a much easier way with a new way of thinking, uh, or if you prefer, Thomas Kuhn might say that we've now reached a point where we can achieve a paradigm change because of the model crisis that's preceded us around these legacy monolithic architectures and the need to evolve forward in order to empower digital transformation from a corporate level. So why now? Is there some magic new technology that's kind of sprang from the ether that we can just simply install and roll out and achieve this Nirvana data mesh? Unfortunately, no, it doesn't work quite like that. Um, we've, you know, what's happened is that we've really hit that point where there's several emerging technologies that have been gradually maturing over the past several years that have now hit a common inflection point where when we take them together, we can achieve really that fundamental new kind of data architecture that we're referring to here as the data mesh, but it's not a singular technology, it's really the confluence of a couple of different technologies that have now reached a point of maturity, but also a point of application where we can apply them to data management practices, whereas in the past we might not, be, uh, might not have been able to do that. So these technologies that we're talking about here are areas like the service mesh, where it's this uh, the, the, the evolution of application development technologies like Docker, uh, Kubernetes, uh, microservices-based REST APIs that have uh, you know, been in use for a while now on the application side, but we're beginning to apply them in some really creative and innovative ways on data management. Likewise, the maturity of software-defined networks and how we do highly secure networking in these multi-cloud environments has really you know, made uh, big significant leaps and bounds just in the last five years. Uh, really the widespread emergence of the public cloud um, as a way of doing secure data processing has driven a lot of these jumps forward in secure software defined uh, networking practices that makes it re much more readily available for us to do decentralized uh, data management where data and data workloads are now spread across a variety of different virtual cloud networks. Um, microservices for data, uh, data replication is really a very new uh, practice area. We can now distribute and deploy uh, strongly consistent data replication technologies across this service mesh that's not something that was previously available. And additionally, we can now use the change data capture and data replication technologies to move data payloads that are polyglot or uh, different uh, formats of payloads. So not just the traditional relational high consistency payloads, but also payloads like JSON and, and Avro and XML. Uh, that are um, a little bit uh, less, uh, less structured and, and less transaction um, compliant than what we would see from a relational world. So uh, likewise, the emergence of ETL processing as something that can be done 
in a stream rather than in these large scale kind of chunky batch processes it allows us to completely shift our mindset about how we uh, do data transformation. So rather than being you know, scheduler driven by the clock, we can now think about doing data movement, data transformation, when the data events happen uh, rather than when the scheduler is running. And so that's a completely different mindset shift in terms of how we do pipeline management for the real heavy work, uh, as we'll talk about in the next section, that drives a lot of the meaning and the semantics of, of the data itself. And then ultimately now it's pretty amazing if you think about what we have access to by way of a massively parallel processing in a cheap and you know uh, affordable um, way that, that can be done on demand in the cloud. And that's something that really just in the last five years has uh, matured uh, an incredible amount. And, and previously, you know, we, we truly did need these large scale monolithic on-premise environments in order to do massively parallel processing. So what that means today is that we can do data management, we can shift these workloads around um, in very efficient ways across a variety of different cloud networks. And so when we take all of these changes together uh, that have happened in kind of the confluence of all of these uh, technical innovations maturing at around the same time, we can now envision a different way of constructing a data architecture, a different way of building out what we call this data mesh. But ultimately, as an IT geek and a business owner, I recognize that we cannot push forward with new technologies just for the sake of technology alone. The benefits of a data mesh are very real, very concrete, and can be measured by the reduction in complexity and cost of managing data across operational and analytics data environments. In the data domain and pipeline-centric concept of the data mesh that we're talking about here, the benefits are very much directly about making trusted, highly consistent data available to the whole enterprise and empowering faster innovation cycles for the business, which ultimately improve the prospects of having a successful digital transformation path forward. Okay, so here's where things may get just a little bit more controversial. Zimak Degani has been a pioneer of Data Mesh since the very beginning, but she's been very clear about her opinion that data pipelines are a second class concern in the Data Mesh. But in this section, I'm gonna argue that in order to realize the full benefits of the data mesh, data pipelines need to be a first class concern. I'm gonna step through a series of metaphors and analogies to make this point. And by the end, you'll see my point of view that for the purposes of DevOps, repeatability, decentralization, and even for creating data products, data pipelines may actually be the most important aspect of the data mesh. Okay, so in the various papers and videos produced by Zemek and the ThoughtWorks team, they've been pretty direct about the idea that data pipelines and tooling should be a second class concern. I think the central thought there is that pipelines and tools are just another implementation detail, and that in order to shift our mindset towards data products and data domains, that we should not over-focus on the implementation details. I sort of get this idea. In the past, the IT organizations have had a tendency to treat data as a byproduct of apps and tools rather than as a central artifact of value. Conventional data pipelines like ETL tools were themselves built on centralized, monolithic, tightly coupled architectures that contribute to the problems that we're trying to rectify with the data mesh. But I feel that it's a false choice to pit data domains against data pipelines. Both can coexist as first class concerns. The fundamental premise for the rest of this section is that without elevating data pipelines into a top class product artifact of concern, we'll never achieve the operational goals of the data mesh. Just in the same way that microservices are the key to unlocking DevOps and CI/CD value for applications, the data pipelines are the essential artifact in unlocking DevOps, uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and data ops benefits in the data tier. And further, it's the data pipelines that are really the essential semantic bridge between the operational data and the analytics data domains that we've discussed in the last section. So ultimately, it is the data pipelines that are like the interconnected root system of a stand of trees, kind of carrying the raw data around as nutrients that produce and feed the data products of an organization. 
You see, the data pipeline is literally where all the action is at when it comes to data, data domains, and data products. Pipelines are where the developers encode business logic. Pipelines are what the data consumers trust to deliver high value data. Pipelines are used for interchange between data domains. And pipelines are critical for intra-domain interchange as well. It's important not to be lulled into thinking that there's a data standard just waiting out there to solve the issues of data semantics and data domains. I've written books about ontologies, taxonomy, data modeling, and data semantics, and there's truthfully very, very few examples of broadly successful standards for dealing with data domains. Most data domain standards actually wind up becoming a political or a commercial expression rather than a technical solution. Likewise, it's a false hope to believe that the on-the-glass simplification of data preparation is the final ultimate solution here. Many years ago, I was leader on one of the very first self-service data preparation tools in the market that happened to use machine learning and natural language processing for a recommendation engine on self-service data preparation. Today, every single analytics tool in the software market has some sort of self-service data preparation user interface, and they haven't in any significant way solved this overarching big problem of monolithic data management that we're trying to tackle with the data mesh. So look at it this way, self-service data preparation and on the glass um, simplification is really, it's a must have feature for a data mesh, but it doesn't go far enough. A data mesh must include many other characteristics in order to be a mesh at all. So to further make the case about why data pipelines need to be a first class aspect of the data mesh, come along with me and let's take a look at some additional metaphors and analogies as examples. So to begin with, consider um, neurons and pathways in the brain. It would be difficult to imagine a situation where we have neurons without the pathways and axions to connect them. In a similar way, I see pipelines as the means to connect data domains and even within a data domain to connect the different semantics or meanings of data elements that are used within a singular domain. Likewise, it's difficult to imagine the concept of ontologies without having the properties to connect them. Uh, for those that know about formal ontologies in a computer science sense, you know that properties are the first class uh, relations that link the entities as part of a large ontology graph. And uh, just as with ontologies where we've elevated the relationship between entities to be a first class aspect of the ontology, I believe we need those data pipelines to be first class elements of a data to mesh uh, of a data mesh to link the domains and to link the data entities within a domain. Similarly, consider this idea of machine learning models and features. It's difficult to imagine a machine learning model where we don't initially develop the features or the data sets to generate the models, the statistical models that actually link the inputs and the outputs together. And so in the same way, these pipelines that are part of a data domain or a data mesh uh, really become the, uh, the, the models or the, the algorithms that join up the data entities within a mesh and across um, different data domains. So likewise, consider whether or not we could create business objects with uh, just entities by themselves or whether uh, we could really do it without the underlying functions or methods that are part of a business object. And in just the same way that methods and functions provide really the action language or the activity language of a, uh, of a business object, I think it's these data pipelines that really encapsulate for us the business rules, the business policies, and really the action language of how we work with the, uh, the, the data resources and the data assets within a data domain and even across data domains. And it's the same concept of having an action language um, to, to follow the metaphor further here with databases. It's difficult to imagine a, a modern database without some type of procedural element to it. All modern databases have a, a, a procedure language uh, that go with it, or if they don't have a procedure language, they have a uh, structured query language or some other query language. And that's because these query languages and the, the procedural elements within a, a database 
uh, really are the action frameworks. And so you don't just have this notion of static data at rest or, or data models at rest. You, you really have to have these behaviors that link the different uh, physical entities, the physical models of, of the database. And it's the same way that um, I see the, the data pipelines coexisting with data domains within a data mesh. You, you really need the action language to go with that. And to kind of bring it back to the real world, you know, outside of software, I guess, uh, consider this idea of whether or not we could really produce products at scale without having the factories that the, uh, build these products. And so in the modern world that we live in, factories really are created to produce the products that we consume at mass and industrial scale. And so we, we have this notion of assembly lines, of supply chains, uh, there's whole processes and methodologies that uh, exist around this idea of creating a product. And it's the same metaphor that I see with the data mesh, where the purpose of a data mesh is, uh, yes, still, of course, to create the data products. That's the, the, that's the reason we do this. But in order to do it efficiently at scale with reusability and with repeatability, we need the automation, we need the factory-like experience that goes into creating those data products. And that's really the role of the data pipelines because the data pipelines, again, it's the action language, it's where the semantics are defined as we move data from one syntax and model and shape into a different syntax into a different model and a different shape. And it encapsulates the business logic and the business policies uh, therein, and so it's these these uh, this idea of of a factory that becomes critically important in uh, considering a data mesh that works at scale. Let's take this concept of a factory one step further. I'm a huge space geek, and one of my absolute favorite things going on in the world right now is the industrial scale effort to build reusable rockets that will soon take ordinary people to Mars. The central driving concept behind Elon Musk's multiple companies is not the product itself. He's actually focused on creating the factories that can make these products at enough scale to change the world. Elon calls this building the machine that makes the machine. It's this matter of scale and repeatability that is at the heart of why I'd say the data pipelines may actually be the most important aspect of the data mesh altogether. There's a world of difference between empowering a company to make a great product one time versus helping companies produce great data products at will, as if on a factory assembly line. By putting focus on data products as a core competency, IT can become the automated machine that produces great data products all the time. Another powerful metaphor to consider is that of Klaus Schwab's Fourth Industrial Revolution. If you haven't read the book, definitely go check it out. The central idea is that we are in the early phases of the fourth wave of industrialization, and that in this wave, it will be the rise of cyber physical systems and extreme automation that further transform the global economy. This isn't just robotic assembly lines of the 1990s. This is decentralized and interconnected factory automation that can operate at industrial scale or as 3D printers in your own home. I'd say that data pipelines are going to be the decentralized smart factories for data products. This loosely coupled mesh of data pipelines will operate at the edge, inside of gateways, in the public cloud and private clouds, and also on premises and data centers anywhere in the world. So while data domains are crucial, data products remain the central reason why we do this in the first place. It will be the data pipelines that materialize the data mesh and make it work. Data pipelines are where the workloads run that take raw data and turn it into data products. Pipelines work within domains and across domains, and they're the producers of data services. Organizations that excel at data pipelines are the ones who will have the greatest agility and run most efficiently at the lowest cost of operations. Organizations that operate universal data pipelines across or uh, operational and analytics domains will reduce the friction between human factors like politics and organizations and improve the ability of IT to quickly react to external forces. So to net out our perspective, 
there are first class properties of data domains and there are also first class properties of data pipelines. On the left, there are obviously many examples of data artifacts that are intrinsically tied to a single data domain. On the right, there are also examples of data pipelines that exist above or across multiple domains. In the middle, we have critically important examples of data pipelines that exist within domains and provide business critical functions in both the operational as well as the analytic data domain context. So I know there's room for data pipelines and data domains to coexist as first class artifacts in a data mesh. And if we fail to bring data engineering and data operations into a first class role, then we'll also fail to solve for the critically important aspects of IT DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and we won't fully realize the promise of unifying operational data resources and analytic data resources together. So what is the truth about a data mesh? In Raphael's famous painting, The School of Athens, Plato points to the sky, indicating his central philosophy that the real world is composed of abstract ideas and concepts. Aristotle's outstretched hand indicates his belief that absolute truth lies in the physical world we can measure with our own senses. Not surprising, as he's known as the father of science. For me, data domains are like business concepts and data schema and data entities, whereas data pipelines are the materialization of data and the physical embodiment of the business rules and policies that shape how data products are consumed. Of course, we know that neither Plato nor Aristotle alone were singularly correct in their estimation of truth, but the duality of their philosophies have shaped the thinking of humanity ever since. You and I both know that data mesh is not as important as the philosophy of truth. However, the same kind of duality is at play. Data domains and data pipelines both play a critical and foundational role in making the data mesh a practical and innovative alternative to the monoliths and data architectures of the past. Okay, here we are in part three of the discussion today. Uh, this is about uh, whether or not the control plane or controller is really a mandatory or fundamental part of the data mesh or not. Um, I pulled in some examples here uh, from uh, the ThoughtWorks team where there's this notion that, well, control planes are really just a matter of convenience. Uh, perhaps they're, they're not mandatory. Um, and that you know there's other ways to compose the mesh let's say without a control plane well spoiler alert from my side uh, i definitely feel that having a control plane in the mix from a data mesh perspective really is kind of a fundamental or mandatory aspect of having a mesh at all and in this section i want to provide a few examples um, and again some more metaphors and analogies of, of why um, I really believe that that controller is a fundamental aspect. You know, take for example, um, what we've seen emerge in the microservices service mesh community around the use of what's called this sidecar proxy pattern. Uh, sidecar proxy is really this idea that you can have a distributed decentralized framework of software components um, with these uh, sidecars, if you will, that are attached into the individual microservices to provide core functions around health, observability, security, network, routing, et cetera. You know, in fact, this idea of a sidecar proxy is actually a derivative of originally going way back, and just to show you how old I am, uh, going way back to the Gang of Four book and what was written about it back in those days around uh, developing the proxy uh, pattern itself. And so sidecar proxy is a derivative of proxy and uh, sidecar proxy today is actually what is the fundamental um, innovation, if you will, or, or at least the, the common pattern that's used across the different service mesh um, implementations that are out there. So obviously one of the more famous and kind of well-known service mesh frameworks is Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes uses the sidecar proxy pattern for its uh, control plane elements. Uh, there are a variety of other service mesh um, uh, implementations out there, console, uh, OpenShift, uh, AWS. There's some work to standardize each and every one of these uh, service mesh implementations implements this notion of a control plane that is separate from 
the data plane, and that provides some of the core characteristics around, again, health, observability, common network routing rules, etc. So I think that this idea of a control plane also applies to really any element of a mesh, or what in uh, common language, what we refer to meshes um, out in the, in the real world. And so if any of you are running a Wi-Fi mesh at home, for example, uh, whenever you implement a Wi-Fi mesh uh, for your home routers, you have to have a controller hub. Um, maybe sometimes it's called a hub, but in effect, this is the controller. And then you have different nodes in your Wi-Fi mesh that all hang off of that same controller or that same hub. And that's really the fundamental distinction between a classical Wi-Fi router and perhaps running multiple of those without having a controller versus a mesh, a Wi-Fi mesh, where you have many different nodes uh, for connecting to the Wi-Fi, but they're all governed by the same controller. And so the, the, the uh, network policies, access rules, governance, all come from one controller in the Wi-Fi mesh. Uh, same thing with this idea of a smart home mesh. And so I'm a bit of a smart home geek myself, um, but uh, these uh, low frequency technologies like Z-Wave, um, Zigbee, uh, they are used across uh, small and large homes. And in order to cover uh, much larger spaces, they all operate as a mesh as well. So they will each repeat um, their IDs and repeat the networks to anything that connects to them. But again, they have to connect back to a common hub. There's this notion of a controller in a Zigbee network. There's this notion of a controller or a hub in a Z-Wave network. And so you can't really deploy a smart home mesh uh, with all these nodes unless you have a controller um, that's actually providing the, the center point of, of governance, control, health, observability, you know, network, uh, et cetera. So this idea, very idea of a smart home mesh requires a controller. Um, you know, even scaling it up a little bit to these idea of 5G mesh capabilities, uh, you know, huge buzzword in the industry as we transition our telecommunications infrastructure from 4G to 5G. Well, one of the core kind of fundamental innovations that's happened in 5G is this idea of uh, creating a mesh around what's called the evolved packet core, being able to have devices and edge nodes all meshed together without having to go back to a single monolithic uh, framework. And so as part of that mesh, um, you can connect to each other, but you still have a common controller. Um, you have a common control plane. And so even as the mesh can get distributed or federated across um, a geophysical space uh, for 5G networks, you still get routed back to a common control plane, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, across that mesh. And so then again there, you see we have that, that common controller. So, you know, in the world of software architectures, of um, of cloud architectures, the controllers typically provide a set of core capabilities around global observability, uh, namespace, security, uh, routing rules um, for the network. Uh, typically, it's the place where you implement uh, the API for the control plane for these common services. Um, and pretty often, in most cases, um, you have to have a durable backing store, which is actually the, the place uh, that provides resiliency in case of uh, disasters uh, or other outages. Um, some service mesh implementations also will implement uh, workload scheduling uh, for workloads that get distributed across the nodes and being able to schedule those as part of the lifecycle management. And then also, in some cases, uh, there's a, a cloud controller for managing downstream components that actually get deployed uh, in the mesh themselves. For example, uh, load balancers that are uh, routing or balancing network loads across the, the mesh endpoints. Um, in contrast, what's part of the sidecar, what actually lives within the individual nodes themselves, would be, uh, for example, a health daemon process that's, that's monitoring uh, what the control plane expects to see as far as uh, good or bad health uh, telemetry or metrics. Um, there's a common uh, metrics provider 
where um, you're uh, constantly emitting uh, 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 signals, telemetry, uh, logging events from the software running in the nodes back to the control plane. And again, it's not just for health, but you can uh, provide a common logging infrastructure and implement services on top of those logs. Um, and then typically there's some type of network uh, proxy uh, that's gonna go into the mesh itself so that you're able to take advantage of what we spoke about earlier in this presentation, which are uh, software defined networks and, and uh, a lot of the innovations that have happened uh, around being able to more effectively control how traffic is routed uh, between a variety of different virtual cloud networks and, and subnets in these uh, modern software-defined networks. So, um, you know, the qu it really begs the question, okay, that's interesting. You might agree with me, hopefully so far, that controllers are an important and integral aspect uh, for something to even be called a mesh at all. Again, I think without a controller, um, the, uh, what uh, Forrester calls the biplane architecture of a controller data plane. Um, I don't think you have a mesh um, in, in, in kind of a physical sense. But it begs the question, do I really need one? Um, uh, Christian uh, Posta here has, has put together what I consider to be a, a really you know, interesting uh, blog post or article around uh, whether or not, it's the topic there that, that Christian posted on is, is around uh, API gateways versus a service mesh. And there's this sort of metaphor of having a, a monolithic type approach versus a mesh approach and what the differences and trade-offs might be. And um, again, you know, spoiler alert, I think the, the outcome of that discussion is that in different situations, uh, different solutions may make sense. And so a serv just as in the world of APIs and application development, it doesn't always make sense to implement a service mesh. Um, in the same way uh, for uh, data management, it's not always gonna make sense to implement a data mesh. There's gonna be use cases where um, going with a more traditional client server architecture or even a monolithic architecture uh, may make sense for you. Uh, but in general, if you're working with data management at large enterprise scale, if you're uh, trying to tame the complexity of, um, of, of legacy monoliths and the DevOps that goes with them, um, and if you're looking for high levels of repeatability across that IT infrastructure for data management, then you may actually really benefit from a, a data mesh. So really in some ways, the core question here is, do I need a decentralized architecture or would a centralized solution uh, be good enough? So for the final section, um, let's talk a little bit more in depth about whether or not you really need a data mesh and what the alternatives might look like. So just to recap, you know, a data mesh, it's really a solution for enterprise scale domains um, and or for event centric cloud projects. So it doesn't have to be an enterprise wide mega project, uh, but if it's a smaller project, you're probably going to be most benefiting from a data mesh if you're looking at event-driven, real-time, cloud-centric uh, use cases. Uh, data mesh is not a replacement for a data warehouse. It's not a replacement for a data lake. Data lakes and data warehouses will continue to exist. And that's kind of the point of a data mesh, actually, is that you're not just going to have one data warehouse or one data lake. You're probably going to have lots of them. And a data mesh is what allows you to kind of live in that distributed and decentralized world where uh, data can be off in far-flung locations, but you need to have reliable and repeatable ways to um, make sure that the data flows uh, between those locations. So the data mesh, in many ways, it's, it's an architecture, um, it's a methodology, it's a data operations model, um, and as we've said numerous times over the course of this presentation, it's focused on outcomes. It's focused on what your data consumers will actually be consuming as data products. Um, one of the reasons in this talk that I've elevated and, and really tried to insist um, that data pipelines are a first class element of data mesh is that a data mesh is also about improving the agility of the IT organization it's about reducing the cost that goes into having huge amounts of uh, uh, human effort go into managing the data architecture. And it's about improving the speed and the agility of which the business and IT can actually innovate 
So there's all of these characteristics uh, of a data mesh that could make sense for you. Um, but the data mesh is definitely not something that you should look at as, you know, just a project that you can, you know, kind of do in a, in a typical project cycle. You're not going to have a, a three month or a six month project where you just, you know, implement a data mesh and, and you're done. Um, in fact, it's not really um, a single tool or a single product that you can buy off the shelf and just say, well, I'm going to install that software and turn it into a data mesh or, or have a data mesh kind of appear after I install that, that, that product. Data mesh, again, it's a combination of it's an architecture, um, it's a methodology, it's a, it's a DevOps model. Um, and in all reality, it's, it's most likely for most large organizations, it's going to be a combination of different technologies that you begin to implement over a long period of time. It's a, it's a fundamental paradigm shift, as uh, Jimac says, uh, what I've mentioned in this presentation, it's a tipping point kind of technology. And so as you begin to implement these uh, technologies over time, you will build out a data mesh cohesively and incrementally as you adopt these modern technologies and modern approaches. Okay, so to data mesh or not to data mesh? That is the question. And so the metaphor, the analogy that I want to leave you with at the end of this presentation is about transportation. If I'm going shorter distances, I'm going to be fine with smaller planes. As I kind of step up, I'm going to need bigger, faster planes to get to where I'm going. And, you know, if I want to go to the moon, well, there's rockets that we built to go to the moon. And if ultimately I want to go to Mars or if I want to, you know, go to the moon and back, you know, multiple times a year on the same rockets, you know, we're, we're building those too. And so there's all these different technologies that have been built and, and uh, for, for travel. And, you know, you don't take these giant rockets uh, if your task is just to go from San Francisco to Sacramento. And so in the same way, you know, I think data mesh is the type of technology that you have to figure out, you know, where you're going and what you want to do and how repeatable, how reusable you want uh, what you're doing uh, to, to accomplish. And, you know, in the same way, I'll point to the the, the chart here on the right uh, with the, the different um, uh, rockets that will go to the moon. You know, it's one thing to build a monolith that you can spend, you know, billions and billions of dollars on to go to the moon, you know, one time where there's no reuse. You basically throw away that rocket um, uh, every time that you've gone to the moon. And each time you go to the moon, you throw away a new rocket. That is a completely different prospect than saying, well, not only do I want to go to the moon, but I want to go to the moon in an affordable way, in a reusable way, and I want this to become something that is mainstream and not just a, a one-off or a monolith. In order to do that, um, you really do need to think about uh, creating the factories as products. You need to think about reuse. You need to change some of the fundamental assumptions about the technologies and the subsystems that are used uh, to deliver uh, you to the moon. And so in, in many ways, that's what the data mesh is about. And if you, if you don't have those use cases, you're not trying to go to the moon, you're not trying to create high levels of reusability and repeatability, you know, you may not need a data mesh. So if you've got just a single application and you want to provide some analytics on it, you know, create a, a basic data warehouse, pull data out using an ETL batch pipeline. Um, if you've got a lot of different source systems, but your uh, analytics use case is very specialized and it's kind of just like a one-off um, uh, project where you're, you're specializing in a, in a particular case and there's not really a need for reuse or repeatability outside of your group or this, this project that you're on. You know, uh, implementing a data mesh architecture may not be the, the right thing uh, for you. Um, if you're a smaller mid-sized company, and um, you're predominantly running all your infrastructure in a single location and you don't have this problem of a distributed de decentralized nature of your of your data you could probably just get away with implementing whatever your cloud vendor technologies are in order to do data integration you don't need to implement a, a data mesh per se uh, go ahead and use the cloud services that uh, perhaps are serverless or most economical uh, for uh, moving data into your analytics environments. And uh, likewise, a lot of large companies, you know, they may have this enterprise problem. They may have this distributed data problem, 
but the thinking of the IT organization is perhaps more conservative, um, more grounded in an incremental approach to build out and not really an interest in being on the leading edge of a technology rollout. In those cases, um, it may make sense to stay with uh, monolithic architectures just in the same way that many large organizations stay on, on mainframes uh, for uh, many, many years. So, you know, when you do decide that you need an, a data mesh, the key thing is not to take a legacy technology, a legacy monolith, and then just put lipstick on it and, and call it a mesh. Um, that's not going to work. So some examples of that, you know, self-service ETL has been around uh, for five to 10 years. Every single analytics engine in the world right now has self-service data integration capabilities built in. Uh, nearly all of them are built around a hub and spoke batch processing architecture model, and you're not going to get to a data mesh just by over-focusing on uh, self-service, you know, uh, what uh, what's easy to use on the glass. In order to get to the, the DevOps and the decentralized benefits of a data mesh, um, you're going to need to make changes on the back-end architectures as well. And like I've argued in this uh, discussion, you can't over-focus on the data domains or the concepts and the schemas and the, the data entities without also thinking about the data pipelines and how the data pipelines are governed, how they're managed, how they're used uh, to, uh, to, to, to make the physical manifestation of the data mesh uh, real, of the semantics of the data, the data products uh, real. Uh, likewise, uh, just doing analytic data integration where all you're doing is focusing on loading the data warehouse or loading the data lake or doing data integration for data science. Um, those are important data domains, but the operational data domains need to intersect with the data domains on the analytics side. And it's you're only going to get to those benefits of a, uh, of a data mesh when you can join up the operational data domains with the analytic data domains and you've got a common infrastructure, not just for pipelines, but also for domain specifications and domain models. Uh, between the operation, uh, operational analytic side of the house. Um, uh, likewise, a data mesh without a control plane is kind of a moot point. It's not really a mesh at all. And again, like I described for uh, Wi-Fi meshes and smart home meshes and 5G meshes, you need to have a control plane. It's, it's one thing to say, I'm going to do node to node connections and I'm going to have a mesh of things in a decentralized space, but without that observer, without the health check, without the common control point for doing security and routing, um, you're not really gonna have a mesh at all. Uh, there's really no difference in my opinion to just kind of the frameworks of the past without having a, a controller. And then finally, uh, doing data ops without actually having a physical data mesh strategy in place um, isn't gonna be that helpful at all. It's just you know data ops without any kind of fundamental shift in, in technology is just kind of a fancy name for data governance. And we've always talked about data governance for the last 20, 25 years. And so uh, to do data ops appropriately where we begin to really think about what does it mean to be more agile in our data management architectures, um, we're going to need to implement something different on the physical side, and that is the data mesh. So, you know, I hope this makes sense um, to you. Um, you know, it, it's a, been a long talk today, so I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in there and, and sticking around. If you're interested in more information about uh, the data mesh, please uh, check out um, parts one, two, three, and four of the data mesh series. And um, those are out there in the YouTube links that I shared at the beginning of the video. And then um, if you'd like to hear more specifically about what we're doing at Oracle and in the Oracle Golden Gate uh, product family for real time and streaming data to implement these data mesh concepts, please reach out to your Oracle rep and we'd be uh, very happy to set up a demonstration or a deep dive talk into how the Oracle technologies uh, fulfill uh, these data mesh capabilities. So um, with that, thanks again for listening. Thanks again uh, for being here. Long discussion today. Hope you found it useful and we'll see you later uh, for part six of the Data Mesh series coming up next month. Thanks again.